Right, uh, good evening everyone. My name is Helen and I work for Devon Wildlife Trust on the Green Mines project in Plymouth. Uh, Devon Wildlife Trust are a partner in this exciting Plymouth City Council led project, which is funded by the European Regional Development Fund's Urban Innovative Actions. Uh, and that's last until August next year. It's a unique opportunity to bring our experience and enthusiasm for wildlife and nature to the green and blue spaces in a large city like Plymouth. So I've been working on things like training community groups with skills to sort of monitor the diversity or biodiversity of their, their local spaces, green spaces, working with Plymouth City Council to see uh, meadow improvements around the city and helping to set up a tree nursery, uh, supporting that at Dareford Community Park and looking at how we can take sort of action for insects in particular by looking at uh, alternatives to pesticide use. So those are just some of the things I'm working on at the moment. And we want to make space for nature while helping people to re reconnect with the natural world and getting all the physical and mental health benefits that we know this can bring. So you can take action for wildlife by visiting greenmindsplymouth.com website and you find out loads more about what Green Minds is up to including other events like this or online and in-person events. Uh, so on to this evening's talk. We're going to learn all about growing trees from seed. Our speaker tonight is Jasmine Atkinson, who's the Community Engagement Officer from the Saving Devon's Treescapes project at the Wildlife Trust. So over to you, Jazz. Oh, thank, thanks so much, Helen. So yeah, hello, everyone. Um, as Helen said, my name is Jasmine or Jazz. And I'm the Community Engagement Officer on the Saving Devon's Treescapes project. I am sharing my screen now, um, so you should be able to see that. Um, so yeah, so Helen asked me to come and talk um, for the Green Minds project all about um, how to grow trees from seed, which is um, quite a big topic and um, can feel slightly overwhelming um, as it's kind of um, spread throughout the year to kind of get your mind around all of those different processes. But hopefully I've kind of broken it down a bit and you know, it's not rocket science at all. Um, and I kind of have aimed it um, for people, anything from someone growing um, just like a tree in your garden or in your windowsill and your window box, um, right through to um, someone who might be thinking about setting up a small community nursery. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, hopefully everyone can gain a bit from this and a bit of inspiration. Um, there are so many resources online as well. So, you know, you definitely don't need to remember it or, or, or write it down. And I'm happy to, to chat afterwards as well. So <clears throat> here we go. Um, a little bit about the project first. So um, the Saving Devon's Tree Skips project is a five year um, project. It's led by Devon Wildlife Trust on behalf of the Devon Ash Dieback Resilience Forum. So this is a big partnership um, project. So you can see our partners below there, you know, AOMBs, councils, um, Woodland Trust, Devon Biodiversity Record Centre. There are lots of people involved, which make it a really strong project. Um, it's funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, One Tree Planted, as well as other smaller funders. <clears throat> and it runs until the end of 2025. Um, we so our, our main aim is to plant and nurture and to give the local communities uh, support to plant and nurture 250,000 trees across Devon in those five years. Um, we focus on trees outside of woodlands, so we do um, plantings up to 500 trees, um, mostly kind of hedgerows, small copses, um, parkland planting, and also um, trees for people's gardens. Um, and we aim to grow a lot of those trees ourselves from seed. Um, at the moment, we get a lot of our trees from the Woodland Trust, who are amazing and supply most of our trees at the moment, as obviously it takes a long time to set up a community tree nursery. Um, but our aim is to kind of become self-sustainable um, with our tree supply. We also have a whole events program. We have a citizen science program and workshops where you can um, learn about lots of different um, species and recording. We um, do school sessions and advisory um, visits. So all ways to try and um, engage people with their local treescapes um, give them a bit of knowledge about you know, not only seed growing, but also just trees in general. Um, most people can't identify our, even our most common trees. Um, 
So do have a look on the website if you want to get involved in there, there are so many other ways you can get involved apart from um, growing trees from seed. Um, so we do cover the whole of Devon, although we uh, have some focus areas that we uh, you know, focus in on, on a bit uh, a bit more. And they they include, you can see the blue here, South Devon, Torbay, Exeter and Cranbrook, the Collie Valleys and the Roche, which actually goes into Somerset as well. And the project came about um, because of the recognition that ash dieback was going to kill around 90% um, of our ash trees in the UK. Um, to kind of give you an idea of the impact that will have, there are 1.9 million mature ash trees outside of woodlands in Devon alone. So that is going to be a huge landscape impact. Ash is our second most common tree outside of woodlands in Devon. It's very common in hedgerows, and in Devon, we're lucky enough to have 53,000 kilometres of hedgerow, although obviously we want more. Um, but yeah, very common in hedgerows. It um, equates to about 22% of the woodland cover, and there are around 448,000 ash trees alongside roads. And they're the ones that I think people are kind of starting to notice they're having to be cut down. Um, so I think most people kind of heard about ash dieback now. Uh, Obviously, as Devon Wildlife Trust, we would always advise if the tree is not um, posing any kind of uh, health and safety threat to leave leave it, um, because standing dead wood, especially ash wood, is amazing for wildlife. And you know, you never know; it could be one of the ten percent that could be resistant potentially. Um, but you know, in in a lot of circumstances, especially um, for example along the roads, you know, they do need to be cut down uh, for safety. Um, so to give you an idea of the wildlife that um, rely on ash trees, which obviously are then going to struggle when those ash um, die, there are 955 species that use ash trees. Uh, 45 of those are obligate, so that's um, they're only uh, they are known only to use ash, and 62 of them are highly associated with ash. Um, so I mentioned our citizen science program earlier. So um, through that, we're doing a, um, some starting some recording to try and um, see how the, some of those species are doing. So some lichens and brown hair strip butterfly, for example. Um, so you can get involved with that if uh, again if you look on our webpage. Um, so that we're kind of like hoping to see like do those um, can those species like swap tree or you know how are they doing. Um, and, you know, it's not just a rural issue. There are 95,000 ash trees in Torbay, which is why it's one of our focus areas. Um, so what do we do? So, you know, so Devon Ash Dieback Resilience Forum wanted to, to respond to this in some way. And there is little point in um, planting ash <clears throat> because it, you know, it will die. So what we decided was to uh, grow and plant as a broader variety of native broadleaf species of tree that we could. Um, obviously, we always focus on the right tree in the right place with the right aftercare. Um, <clears throat> but if we can get that nice broad range of um, trees into our landscape, it will make our treescapes more resilient to things like climate change, um, other diseases coming in, for example. Um, <clears throat> so, Trees that we grow, often people say like, oh, what can I grow? What do you grow? Um, we grow yeah, anything we can kind of get our hands on the seed that's native to Devon. So wild cherry, oak, birch, field maple, the more kind of shrubby trees, like, like a smaller kind of shrubby trees like, like hawthorn, blackthorn, gelder rose, <clears throat> um, and hazel. So yeah, a whole, I mean, yeah, and some of the um, rarer kind of things as well, like Devon white beam, we've been trying as well. So where do we do this? Um, so we have our community tree nursery at Meath Quarry. It was set up in March 2020 at the beginning of the project when it was just a pilot project. Um, this uh, this nursery is at our Meath Quarry Nature Reserve. It's near Hatherley. Um, it's not open to the public, but we have volunteer days. So if anybody ever wanted to come and visit, if they got in touch with me, um, you could come along to a volunteer day and and help out and uh, and and have the tour. We do occasionally um, have open days as well. So 
Our aim here is to grow around seven and a half thousand trees per year. Um, and they stay in that nursery for two years. So, you know, at any one point we could have 15,000, that's right, isn't it? 15,000 trees um, growing. And our volunteer group there is, they do, you know, all of the tasks throughout the year. They're absolutely amazing. And they give their time to process tiny little rowan seeds uh, or, or whatever, you know, is needed throughout the year. So it's, it's a brilliant place. And there's just some more photos of our community tree nursery. We are also opening a second nursery um, in Broadcliffe near Exeter. So maybe a bit more uh, accessible for, for some people to visit. So um, I'll maybe talk a bit about this uh, later, but I'll, I'll introduce it now. So <clears throat> the Meath, our Meath Quarry um, community tree nursery is cell grown trees. So we grow trees in cells here. It's on a concrete pad. So we don't have any uh, ground to grow the trees in, if, even if we wanted to. But the cell grown trees are brilliant because we use them to give to community groups when um, they are distributing them. So we have free tree hubs where we give communities like around 300 trees and then they set up an event where people come and collect um, one to five trees for their gardens. And the cell grown trees are brilliant because they have um, soil around the roots so they don't dry out and you're not in you don't have a really uh, tight time scale to plant them and they're really good for things like school school plantings where they can end up kind of on the ground for a little while our broadcast nursery will be bare root so that's where you grow in the ground and then when you're ready to plant you dig them up you shake the soil off and you've literally got a tree Free and the roots and no soil and you're under a really kind of tight time scale to plant those so really ideally you need them heal, healed in or planted within 24 maybe 48 hours and if you are you know when you're planting them you need them wrapped in plastic and really you don't want them out of that bag for, for very long at all so these are really good for landowners who are you know going to do that quite quickly so yeah, pros and cons to both, which I'll talk a bit more about later. But you can see here our Meath Quarry Nature Reserve is at uh, cell grown cell grown trees. So how can you grow trees from seed? Let's let's get into it. So the first thing to think about is your site. So you know it could be your windowsill, it could be your garden, or you might be looking at something a bit bigger, like an allotment or a community garden. Uh, you the first thing to to decide really is are you going to do bare root or are you can do cell grown so if you've got ground to plant into you're probably going to go bare root and it has a lot of benefits so for example the cell cellular trees they dry out a lot quicker when they're actually being grown so you need to water them quite a lot and like last summer we were growing and uh, we were watering our trees twice a day when it was at that hottest, um, driest, I'm just gonna admit somebody there. Okay. Um, when it was at its hottest, driest uh, time, we were having to, to water those twice a day. Whereas when they're bare root in the ground, they don't dry out as, as quickly. Um, the cellular plants also need uh, fertilizer um, a lot more. And, you know, they are a lot more, uh, they have a lot smaller space for growing. So they don't, they don't get so big. Um, but I've been through the benefits of that you know if you're if you think that you are needing like time in between kind of giving them to the to the place that's distributing or planting and and the time that they're actually going into the ground then yeah maybe you want to go cellular if you're worried about them drying out and, and the roots dying um so if you do decide to go for bare root you'll then need to look at your soil and site conditions so you don't want to be planting into waterlogged soil. You might want to think about improving the soil, maybe incorporating some organic matter. Um, and you, you also, you ideally, you want it to be quite sheltered. And you might think about shading. So there might be some natural shade, which would be good, like um, dappled shade, or you might think about having some shade netting. And that's the case with the cellular as well. Because uh, you do need a bit of um, a bit of shading for your trees. 
size again you can grow a tree in a tiny pot so you can literally have uh yeah like a 10 centimeters of space <laughs> or you know right up to really big uh one thing we always advise with our beds is ideally you'd be able to reach into the middle without having to uh go into the bed and try and avoid the trees um if that makes sense so we always suggest a 2.4 by 1.8 size bed and you can grow where well, you can grow around kind of depending on the species up to 40 trees per square meter so that should give you a bit of an idea you can grow a lot more in a lot tighter space with the cell grown trees uh preparing the ground you want to strip off the turf dig it over incorporate some organic matter if you feel that's necessary and of course weed it because um, any weeds in the cellular in the cell uh, root trainers or the ground you know that's going to compete so ideally get rid of all the weeds um you want to consider biosecurity you don't want to be bringing in pests and diseases so a uh, boot cleaning station at the entrance if you're going like kind of for a community tree nursery so you just want like a brush and some disinfectant and deer and rabbit protection because you don't want all your trees to be nibbled so depending on the site and um, what you've got around you know you, you might think about some fencing okay so the process so here's a kind of brief uh calendar so autumn well mostly autumn mostly between uh the end of august and kind of end of november is your seed collecting time and you seed processing processing kind of sits alongside that so that's like a really really busy time stratification is uh i'll talk about in a minute but it's, it's basically where you're breaking dormancy over the winter you don't really have to do much pricking out in the spring that's another kind of busy time uh and then you'll be growing on ready for planting so let's break that down Seed collecting. So as I said, mostly uh, from the end of August to end of November, uh, obviously different seeds ripen throughout that uh, season at different times. So you just have to keep an eye on uh, what, what is ripening um, when. And, you know, last year was weird and everything was quite, quite um, early. Uh, but, you know, well, I guess Rowan kind of came fairly early this year. Um, hazels are around the middle and then kind of later on you've got spindle um but yeah you can kind of like um you can collect for a, like a few weeks for each um species really one thing you should probably think about is collecting from lots of different trees so you don't want to collect all your rowan from one tree it's better to have good genetic diversity and to collect uh, from from different trees and preferably different sites. Uh, collecting around the edge of a woodland is always a bit more fruitful because they have more light, they produce more seeds. Uh, if you can collect from ancient, well, ancient older woodlands, old hedgerows, uh, that is good because you know it will be um, native British uh, strains um and things to bring with you you don't really need very much buckets or paper bags you might want a pair of secateurs because things like rowan and gelder rose you want to chop and take the whole kind of bunch of berries rather than um things like hawthorn you can just pull the berries off uh don't mix the seeds because then you've got to unmix them at some point which is time consuming um and Maybe some labels, you want to write down what you collected and where, where from. And be careful with blackthorn because if you get uh, spiked with blackthorn, it can cause blackthorn blood poisoning. So if you, yeah, if you feel any tingling, go to your GP or hospital. Um, so I think that kind of covers most of that. Um, and then kind of as soon as you can after collecting, you want to process those seeds. Different seeds require different amount of processing. It might be that you think you don't have that much time, so you might want to go for seeds that are really quick to process. So, for example, um, oaks and hazels, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
uh, as opposed to the berries, which take a lot longer. Uh, on the left here, you can see a picture of um, someone uh, collecting, uh, processing some crab apple. So crab apple is quite easy. You just cut into the crab apple. Don't cut all the way through because you can cause damage to the seed. Um, cut open a little bit and then kind of crack it open. And there should be a few seeds in there. Normally there's kind of one or two like good juicy ones and a couple of like little tiny ones that aren't going to do much. Make sure you break it all open because often there's uh, little segments kind of hiding. And they just look like little apple pips, really. And that's all you've got to do for, for crab apples. And they don't come with loads of gunk and they're just easy. And then what you're going to do with those seeds and what you do with most of them is you're going to mix them with uh, a 50-50 mix of compost and sand. Or you can use coir which is what we are doing more and more at our nursery. And then you're going to put them into a sandwich bag or a tub, and they're going to be put in a cool, dry place, or preferably in a fridge, if you're willing to give up space in your fridge, over the winter for stratification. So we'll kind of come on to that a bit more in a minute. So acorns and hazelnuts are the easy ones. So acorns and hazelnuts have a shell and then a seed inside. To know whether the seed is viable, so whether there is a seed actually inside, you can do the float sink test. Put them in a bucket of water, and if they float, the likelihood is, is that they don't have a seed inside. If they sink, the likelihood is, is that they do, and they will be viable. So chuck the ones that float, and if you're unsure, maybe just cut a few of them open and check, normally well I've never had a good one that's floated so um and then so the, the good ones the ones that sink they are going to go in your bag of compost and sand the hazelnut size they're going to go in their bag of compost and sand in the fridge hazelnuts are a little bit different because they're going to go in the fridge for a month and then come out for a month and then in the fridge for a month out of the fridge and so on until spring um acorns on the other hand, uh, the same. So do the float sink test. And then you can, acorns just sprout really quickly, really easily. They're brilliant. So all you really need to do, I mean, you could just literally plant them into your root trainers or, or your pots. Um, or you can put them into a bucket of soil and then as and when they sprout, um, germinate, then plant them so that you know that they are viable rather than them to kind of taking up a space. So yeah, they do not need to be stratified over the winter. They can just be sown in the autumn. Um, I haven't actually kind of explained what root trainers are. So root trainers are what we use for our cellular grown trees. There, you can see them in the picture on the right here. They're kind of, they come in like flat pack, like a book and you kind of, uh, <laughs> bend them up and bring them together and, and put them into a, a frame. And they're really good because when you want to plant your trees or give them out, you just open up that book and, and it just comes out really easily. And they've got these um, ridges that uh, encourage the roots down rather than the roots going round and becoming like um, pot bound. So they're, they're really good if you can get your hands on them and make sure you get the deep ones if you're going to do it because they're, they're good for a tree growing. Um, so that is hazelnuts and acorns. Just going back to collection, hazelnuts collect them from the tree, acorns collect them from the ground. Um, often you, is, you need to sometimes collect hazelnuts a little bit before they're ripe because otherwise the squirrels eat them. And the squirrels know, somehow, magically, know which ones are good and which ones don't have um, a, a seed in, which ones are just the shell. They they chuck. And so if you're too late and you collect a load of hazelnuts, you'll think like, oh, great, there's still loads left. And then they will all float. So just be quick. <laughs> um, there's a bit of a balance. You don't want to collect them too, um, too unripe, but you, you don't want to leave it too late because squirrels will eat them. Ah, 
make sure you protect them. So even if you're going to grow bare root in a bed, um, don't grow the hazelnuts and the acorns in there. Grow them in pots or root trainers because the squirrels will eat them if they're in the ground. And if, if you put them in root trainers, you can put mesh over the top to protect them and keep the squirrels off. OK, I've clumped uh, these into dry seeds, which is not a technical term. Um, so birch, birch is a really quick, easy one to collect. You can collect thousands in seconds. They come in cat, cat, like kind of catkins and you just break them up into little tiny seeds and they can just be stored in a paper bag over the winter in a cool, dry place. Make sure you label them. Uh, filled maple, on the other hand, a little bit different. So you feel with filled maple, you want to, uh, because they kind of come in clumps, but break them up into their kind of individual seeds with the wing. You can take the wings off or not. We don't bother. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can store them for like a, a, a week or two. Um, I think maybe up to a month. And then it's good to sow them then directly, like in the autumn, in the late autumn. So uh, we've, as you can see here, used the sandpit because that's cheap and big, um, a child's sandpit. Uh, you can fill the bottom, make sure it's got holes in it, fill the bottom with uh, gravel and stones for drainage. And then you want your compost and then a layer of filled maple, try and make sure they're not overlapping and then compost over the top firm it down and they will germinate in the spring and you can prick them out so that they're, they're easy. I'm trying to think if there are any other dry seeds I should mention. Um, hornbeam you could put in this group. Um, we don't grow hornbeam at the nursery because it's not uh, native to Devon um, and it's also quite complicated so you have to soak for 24 hours and then take them out and then soak for 24 hours and take them out. So that's one to look up, um, but you could have a go. So berries, the most time consuming of them all. Um, berries come, so some of them, for example, hawthorn, blackthorn, gelder rose, they have one seed per berry. Whereas others like rowan have like three to five seeds per berry and are very tiny. So it kind of varies on how long it takes to process the different species. But generally what you want to do is crush them up so you can either use uh, like a back of a rolling pin or something uh, and then and then squash it through a sieve and a bit of water helps with that too to try and get as much of the flesh off as possible. The flesh is going to inhibit germination. You want to get rid of it and have a fairly clean seed. Or what we find is easier most of the time is to just squash it with our fingers and get that berry out um, and then just give them a little rinse. And then pat them dry with a bit of kitchen roll. You don't want them to dry out. So don't like leave them for days on kitchen roll. Uh, just pat them a bit and then you're mixing them with that compost sand mix and they're going in the fridge. Uh, one thing just to be careful about is toxicity. Blah, toxicity. So uh, uncooked rowan berries. <laughs> if rowan is fine to eat if you cook it for jam, but it, it is toxic when it's um, not cooked. Uh, Gelder rose and um, I'm trying to think of this, like spindle, they're quite toxic. So you wanna be wearing gloves really. Um, you might think about having eye protection uh, and obviously like wash your hands thoroughly after all these things, but especially those uh, before, you know, going about your other things. Uh, and then stratification. So this is where we're breaking the dormancy over the winter. We put ours in a giant fridge that we've got. We're lucky uh, with that, but you can just put them in a cool, dry place. The problem we have is that obviously our winters are kind of getting quite mild and then you'll have a really cold snap and then warm and cold and it's confusing for the seeds. Um, so if you put them in the fridge, you just know that you have had that constant cold temperature to kind of mimic winter, like a good winter. Uh, and so they're really going to be in the fridge from around the beginning of November, the end of October to around February, March. But it does vary on the species. So I would recommend the tree. So the tree council have a really good book 
um i think it's called the seed growers guide and they also have a web version now i believe uh or you can um talk to me and i can put you on my list of uh micro nursery contacts which i'll talk a bit about later Oh, and make sure you label them. So, I mean, at our nursery, we label with, we weigh our seeds for one. We So we weigh them and we put that on the label. And we also put what they are, obviously, uh, when we collected them, where we collected them, when we processed them, um, so that we can kind of track what, you know, what we're getting and how many germinated. But you might decide just to put where you, what are, you know, what they are really. And that, that would be fine too. Or you could just not label them. <laughs> you could just be like a surprise um and then in the spring you onto germination so the seeds come out so they might start germinating in the fridge and then you can get them out or you know or get or just get them out and they can go into propagators so fill the propagator with compost um firm it down because you don't want loads of air in it firm it down and then if you've got seeds like um gelder rose or hawthorn where they're quite big you can place them nicely in rows if it's something like birch, you might want to broadcast them just across. Um, you can mix them with sand, like dry sand, and it helps you spread them nicely and like them not uh, not kind of be in like little clumps. Uh, and then top it with compost, or you can use vermiculite. And then you so you you then wait um, until they're big enough to prick out. So I'm just going to go and say right. This is a very blurry photo and apologies, but it was the only one I had that I could see that would show the seed leaves and then the true leaves. So when uh, seedlings first come up, they have their, uh, their seed leaves, so cotyledons. So their little round leaves, they all kind of look the same. And then their second set of leaves are their true leaves. So they kind of look like tiny version of the adult leaves. So this is Rowan, for example. So that's at the point where you want to prick them out and use a little pen to like wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. You hold the uh, seed leaves. Don't hold the stem. Ideally, don't hold the true leaves. Hold the seed, le seed leaves, wiggle them out, and then you put them into your root trainers or into your bed or your pots, yogurt pot, whatever you got. Um, when we... When we grow in our root trainers, we fill our root trainers half with compost, and then we put some fertilizers, some biochar in a teaspoon, and then top it with uh, with um, compost, and then we put our seedling in. However, we are looking into pellet um, fertilizer because it's um, more slow release. But you might, the point is, you might want to just think about some fertilizer as well. Uh, again, throughout that filling you want to just pat it down you don't want lots of air in there and then water them with a watering can with a rose on it you can um water from below so put in the tray of water but yeah a, ro a, ro a watering can with a rose on it is is good but yeah you don't want to flood you know drown your um your seedlings so just be careful with that And then they're going to stay in those root trainers or in your bed for two years until they're ready to be planted out into their final locations. So in the summer, you want to water, you have to water them. So think about um, where you're going to get your water from. Rainwater is ideal. Or you might, you know, might have a mains tap. So make sure you've got access to water. And you need to weed. So, yeah, you don't want that competition. And like our... Um, our root trainers get a lot of moss and a lot of willow, willow seeds blowing in. So it's a real kind of like keeping on top of it thing. Uh, and just depending on your scale, you know, that could take like a little, just a few seconds each day or, you know, it could be like a kind of group thing you want to you want to organize. Also think about um, shade and protection, uh, which I mentioned before. So we use shade netting, which provides about 50 percent shade uh and so there's kind of two options there i mean we put one lot which is very very high up obviously and then well, there's smaller beds here which kind of show you can use um hoops or, or you know whatever whatever you've got uh and then in the winter you might want to think about fleece if it's going to get very frosty so we're thinking about fleece for the end of this week because it's supposed to get very cold 
Um, and then, right, and then you're on to planting your tree. I'm aware that I'm kind of getting to 40 minutes, so I'll, but I've, I've only got a few slides left. So before you, before you even collect, think about where your trees are going. You need landowner um, permission, and you um, want to know what you know what what trees are going to suit that site are you going to do a hedgerow in which case you might want to collect a few more hazels if you want like a hazel hedge with a few other species in or you might just do it completely mixed uh, if you've got a very wet site you might go for alder and willow for example um or if you're having a woodland planting you might go for more oaks if you're planting if you want a tree for your garden you might not go for oak you know you might go for something smaller like rowan gelder rose um potentially crab apple so yeah, it's good to have your final place in mind before you even collect. Uh, you also might want to think about um, protection. So we advise canes and spirals for hedgerows or where there's rabbits and tubes and stakes when there's deer, you know, potentially around and then kind of a more of a copse planting. Um, you can also heal in. So as I mentioned before, once you um, once you dig up your bare root trees, you have a very short time to plant them. However, if you've got lots and you kind of don't have the time to uh, dig them all up and then plant them immediately, you can heal them in. So you can dig them all up and bundle them and then uh, just put them. Normally, you kind of dig a trench, put them at an angle and then cover with cover the roots of compost. And they're just really easy to pick out. So that's a kind of way to have them ready to go. And here's an example of that. Um, or, you know, you might decide instead of um, planting them, you might decide to give them out. So you might have a bit of a community event or a fair where you want to give, give out the trees. And again, like maybe have in your mind, if you're going to do that, you might want to aim for the smaller, the smaller tree species. And of course, remember your aftercare. So when a tree is planted, it needs to be watered if it's very dry. The little whips are much better to establish um, so I should have mentioned, we normally aim for our whips to be about 20 to 40 centimetres uh, at that two year mark, and then they're ready to, to be planted out. So they're much more likely to establish at that age um, and size rather than like bigger trees, but you still might need to water them. So thinking about a water source, thinking about is there somebody that can kind of go and check for pests and diseases or any um, dead that needs to be pruned off or any that haven't survived. Um, yeah, and just making sure that 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 they are going to be looked after, and then in five to sorry, ten to fifteen years, that's when you're going to be removing your protection. So this is a long term. Yeah, having somebody to to look after your trees and make sure that protection is removed, otherwise the tree will grow into it and it won't do it any good. So uh, we do offer a micro nursery kit a scheme. It's incredibly popular, and uh, we do uh, run out quite quickly, but. I thought it'd be a good idea to put up just what we have in those kits, because you might think that that, you know, if you want to set up a little nursery of your own, things to buy are uh, potentially a raised bed frame. Having the frame does help because it stops the grass encroaching onto the bed. So it kind of saves you weeding a bit. Uh, it's also good if somebody is like mowing, for example, like it kind of shows where the bed is and then the trees aren't going to get mown. So it's quite a good idea to have it. Or, or, and or you might go for your root trainers. So there you can see the root, root trainer open. So it kind of shows what I was explaining earlier. Uh, propagators, you you might want, or you will you probably will need. And then you might want to think about your uh, fertilizer, some sand for the uh, stratification, vermiculite, um, and then some mesh to protect the hazels and acorns and um, shade netting if you haven't got um, natural shade on your site. Um, I am trying to put together a like huge spreadsheet of all the timings for everything. Um, uh, we've got a kind of basic one here, but you know, there's lots of information online. And as I mentioned before, the Tree Council are a really, really good resource. So check them out. And they've actually got a, um, a website which shows how to set up a tree nursery now um, on a kind of maybe on a bigger scale but there's some good information in there <laughs> and yeah just have fun and um 
you know it's a really good way if you've got a community garden or something it's a really a good way to bring people together and you know it's, it's such a good long-term thing to do and something that feels like really positive in what can feel like a bit of a um hopeless <laughs> at times um you know situation so it's uh yeah I hope everybody has um got something from this and you'll go away and uh, grow your own food from seed um, Helen, shall I bring you thank back you, in? If I share yeah, thank you, That was amazing. And thank goodness we're recording it because I can't remember all that. <laughs> so I might have to watch it back. But well, but um, we will say I will do a follow up email. So I will try and include uh, some of the links like the tree council information. Mm -hmm. I've got a few bits and pieces that I can send around. But of course, you can always rewatch the recording once it's on the Green Minds YouTube channel. Um, so we have got a few questions. So if anyone's got any question, don't, anything you like, please pop it in the chat. Also, it's a good, um, we always ask for any feedback for our events. So if you've got any feedback, uh, or uh, that would be lovely if you could pop it in the chat, um, as it's, it's really good to sort of help us guide future events and show our funders if it's nice feedback. <laughs> um, all feedback is welcome. Uh, and also if you've got comments, if you're thinking of setting something up or you want more advice, like we can always, um, I could always put um, Jazz's details in the follow up email and, and people can get in touch, can't they? Because we couldn't fit everything into this sort of talk. So um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, when you, you know, you mentioned about that we're not, uh, you're not planting new ash trees. Um, someone is julie's asking how do we know that those new ash won't grow like won't they have will they get some immunity over time sort of why don't yeah. we start give it a go i suppose yeah i mean the hope you know yeah mm. hopefully you know if you did plant ash they would survive um but the likelihood is low and so therefore um I think we just wanted to put our efforts into something that you know we would be more sure would would work yeah. and you know a lot of people are saying now like that you know the the woodland trust um planting uh scheme that they've had going for a long time is amazing and but uh, you know a lot of people planted a lot of ash within those packs mm -hmm. you know at like 10 20 years ago and now they're having to fill those gaps in mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, for us, it didn't feel worthwhile at this moment, but I guess they'd only have a five or 10 percent chance of surviving. Yeah. And actually, yeah, I think there's a lot of research, isn't there, going on, like Forestry yeah. Commission and, and other mm -hmm. organisations are doing a lot of research, as has been done in other countries in Europe, to look at the genetically resistant ones and mm -hmm. then start to breed from those trees, as it were. Yeah, so I think in, you know, a few years time when that's a bit further down the line, then, you know, yeah, maybe, that, hopefully. Once we know we've got those resistant strains, we can then have a big push, hopefully, to get some mm. back into the landscape. Yeah. Um, and then Julie's also asking about the seeds. Do all seeds need stratification? But I think it might be worth, if you clarify what stratification is and the general yeah. sort of premise. So, yeah, so the stratification is the, that um, uh, breaking of dormancy over the winter. So where we're putting it in the fridge, um, no. Uh, so the so the is it kind of the answer? So acorns, um, like I said, acorns sprout like kind of immediately, so they can be potted up straight away. Um, but you know, yeah, mo most tree seeds do need that do do need that stratification, whether it be in the fridge or you know, like the field maple. That's still cold stratification outside, um, but you know, not. But in a slightly different way. Um, so yeah, apart 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 from acorns, yeah. yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and then we've got a question from Roger, um, who's trying to grow some Devon white beam. Um, mm. Have you? Can you advise on when do you know that the fruit are ripe? Mm. Would it be um, soft or very squidgy? <laughs> is yeah. So. For people that don't know what Devon white bean fruit looks like, it's almost like a tiny crab apple that's like redder and squishy, yeah. But they don't go really, really squishy, but they go like a kind of almost like a rotten apple kind of um amount of squish. So yeah, it's when they're kind of ready orange 
and they're quite squishy I would say like if you can squish it in your fingers then I think it then it's ready um and the seed if you squish a few it's like with crab apple if you break a few open and have a look at the seed if they're like tiny and shriveled no wait um if they're like looking really juicy then go for it good that great answer thank you and then we've got a question from David have you got or any thoughts about beech beech trees mm. and seeds I'm guessing yeah, it's so similar it's not technically native it's not technically native to <laughs> Devon um yeah so we don't grow beech um because it's not technically native to Devon it's native to the east of England um <laughs> But, you know, you can grow it. <laughs> do you, and do you um, know how, tree. if someone wanted to do that, what, is there a particular way I, of propagating I don't know. the seed? You would have to look it something, yeah. I haven't done it. so It I, might be on the tree council information. Yes, so it's, sorry. Yeah. Well, I love a beech tree, but yes. I know, well, um, yeah, and they're beautiful trees. They do have <laughs> a very dense canopy, so you don't get much understory. Mm. Um, so that's mm. just something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, uh, which does make me think I should have included older in that kind of dry seed mix. So older is, I, I imagine birch might be a bit like older, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, so it yeah, might be worth distinguishing between older okay. and elder because people do get a oh, bit Yeah, yeah older. Often. So I'm, yeah, so older um, with an A, they have the little, like little tiny cones and then you're waiting for those to turn from kind of green to like more brownie and then you shake them, you put them in the tub, like, Ugh! then all the um, seeds come out and they're tiny. Um, elder is like with a berry that you make elder very cordial from or whatever. Um, so more of a shrub and that, yeah, and that's the berry with a tiny seed again. Um, I'm yeah. not sure about beach, but it, and you oh. know what? The another website, another good website to look at is um, TCV. So the Conservation Volunteers. Oh yeah, I've they, got a link to that, it so I'll, I'll yeah. share that with people. Yeah, they break it down um, species yeah. by species. So. so we don't have any other qu questions there, but I had a couple of questions. Um, did you want to mention about you know that you showed a picture of the free trees and the tree yeah. hub? Do you want to mm. mention about those yes, in case please. people want, <laughs> or are they all finished now? I don't know. No, they haven't finished. Thank you, Helen. I should have. <clears throat> so yeah, our free tree hubs run throughout um the end of November to well, this year about mid-February. So this is where we give communities um, <clears throat> trees and then they uh, set up an event to give those trees out to their community. So they've all been organized now, but you can go along to one and collect um, up to five trees for your garden. They're all on the Devon, Devon Wildlife Trust website and we've tried to spread them out geographically. We've already had a few, but there's still look quite, quite a few left. Um, they are incredibly popular. <clears throat> and they run out of trees very, very quickly. Be aware that they are widths, so don't travel, because <laughs> we've had people traveling miles and miles. Um, please don't do that. Like they're kind of designed for, um, you know, like the like the kind of local area, and they're just kind of little, little whips. And yeah, go along, there's normally a queue, get there early, and hopefully you can get your uh, your five trees for your garden. That's great. And yeah, if you travel too far, you're going to spend way more on petrol yeah. than if you went to your local garden centre and brought some bought some little whips. And yeah, exactly. Obviously, growing it yourself is the cheapest option. Um, yeah, and, and what about I mean, the, yeah, one thing? Um, can I, sorry, Helen. Can I um? Yeah. I, I really have missed a major major part here. Where why you know why do we want to grow trees from seed? Um, so local provenance is really good because it stops the spread of disease. If you, you know, if you buy a tree from a nursery, like, you know, wherever in Scotland or whatever, you know, it's traveling a long way and you can spread disease. Um, so locally, pro pro local provenance seeds are really good for that. Also, they are more likely to be, um, that they'll be kind of set up for the local conditions or local soil conditions and climate conditions so they're more likely to survive and thrive uh so yeah they're it's just brilliant to grow trees and seed on on lots of different levels and actually the whole reason that we've got the ash dieback is through the importation of of young trees uh, into tree nurseries and that's managed to sort of spread it all over the country so that local mm -hmm. provenance thing genetics or diversity is is good isn't it um, you know, you mentioned the micro nurseries. I was just wondering, 
do you have kits is that for a particular group do you have to be in those areas that you mentioned they don't need to be in those areas um it is very popular so what i tend to do is have a bit of an application process um which i'll do over the early summer so if anybody is interested it might be worth just emailing me um and i am sure helen will include my email in a yeah. uh, follow-up email so just email me and we can have a bit of a chat and then you can have an application form if if that's something you'd like to do. Um, we have lots of other schemes within the project that I haven't even mentioned, like orchard, our community orchard scheme, um, and you know, landowner plantings up to five hundred trees. So there are many, many ways that you can uh, get You've involved. You've been doing in um, some bat sur bat surveys as well. Yeah, we do. Yeah, so we have a whole citizen science program. So yeah, bat surveys, um, brown hairs doing butterfly surveys at the moment. We're looking at the eggs lichen surveys uh we have online mm -hmm. and in-person uh training for that so and so, so if people were keen to volunteer at Meath or Broad, uh -huh. at the new one at broadcast then they again they can just email you and if i put your yeah. details on the on the follow-up i had just one other question it could be a bit controversial um like there's a hell of a lot of plastic involved in all that isn't there and i just yeah. wondered especially if people are about to sort of rush out buying all stuff for, to make their own nursery at home or in their local community. Yeah. What, how have you dealt with that? Because obviously you don't want the, the impact of everything you buy and the, using the fridge and all the poly tunnel, everything to kind of be worse than the good eff effects that you're doing of planting and growing all those thousands of trees. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> it's, um, it's something in the project that, uh, is very difficult and we um i'm just looking up to see because we've actually got a talk about um plastics within the the tree growing world and i'm just having a look to try and find the date but i, I can't oh, find that it would be great date. i can always circulate that as well if you yeah send it include it in the email um it's coming up quite um quite soon and so that's the woodland trust giving that talk because mm. they've been doing a lot of trials on different um protections so you I think there's some things that use like cornstarch various um we have tried some kind of cardboard tubes in the past but the problem is is that plastic works really well <laughs> and everything else doesn't yeah. um and they don't you know it doesn't have that kind of lifespan it needs yeah so you can um, once you've got it you can reuse it you many many times it. yeah mm -hmm. reuse it definitely the root yeah. trainers you can reuse the only problem is that it does kind of all become quite brittle because hmm. um, it's outside in all weathers because it's outside yeah um so but you know yeah if you're growing <clears> trees <throat> yourself you know use the use the pots that um you know your trees i think you had some takeaway from. containers there with seeds Do yeah you yeah collect the seeds and things like that that's, that's really it. good yeah good you, you know yeah. you can use anything just you know yeah have some yeah. holes in the bottom um yeah. one well, thing someone's just put a really good idea on here julie again you could use old like coke bottle cola bottles yeah put yeah. them into a spiral like make your own or, um, Tetra packs, you know, like your orange juice comes in. And yeah. the only thing is, if you're growing in a pot that you've bought something from the garden center in, is to just uh, you might want to think about sterilizing it first. Yes, yeah. Or looking out for re stuff that's made from recycled plastic, I guess. And the other thing I think we should mention is never buy compost with peat in it. Yeah. Always, or you yeah. always go for a peat free, don't you? Because that. Yeah. causes even more damage <laughs> mm -hmm. um i don't know if i'm allowed to um recommend a particular brand but i'm going to you could just so mention we, what you use <laughs> we use the um, melcourt silver grow peat free multi-purpose compost uh we find it just holds the water a bit better it's a good yeah it's a good kind of texture um i was just gonna think of something else then what was it that's uh, really useful to know oh so yeah. the other thing so with them um, protection if you're if you're growing the tree in your garden you probably don't need to put any protection on you know you don't include a spiral don't don't put a tube on if you don't think it needs it um and the other thing you can do is plant more densely so some people just plant very very densely with the knowledge that they will lose like a certain percentage so that's another option you know or you can fence like around but if you have like a, a planting of like 100 trees or whatever, instead of having 100 tubes, 
fence around it. But yeah, it's a difficult Brilliant. one. Thank you. Well, I think that's, um, there's no other question. So I think that's a really good point to end a couple of minutes early. Um, thank you so much, Jess. That was really good. And uh, it, it sounds like it's such a brilliant project and you've still got quite a long time to run with it, haven't you? Another yeah, so it runs till the end of 2025. So people have yeah. got Yeah, so there's to loads of opportunities involved. to get involved. Um, I'm sure there'll be some more talks and events around that and, and if people get the chance to visit a tree nursery that's the best way to sort of learn and if you're if you're in Plymouth or near Plymouth we will be getting this uh, supporting this tree nursery going at Pool Farm in Dareford Community Park which is the Plymouth City Council's owned farm um, so and uh, we're going to model that on the Meath one which has been so, so successful so there there'll hopefully be a trick and effect of lots of nurseries sort of Two nurseries popping up everywhere. So yeah, thanks again, um, everybody. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at another event soon.